Uh, welcome, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Um, I recognize some familiar faces, some of going back to lectures I gave many years ago, uh, but tonight will be very different from medieval Europe or the French Revolution. Um, but I want to add a little addendum to the safety announcement. Um, I trust that you all know what to do if the lights go out. You all raise your hands, because many hands make light work. <laughs> That's, that's the first and last of the joke. <laughs> OK, so why should we remember the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic? After all, it was 100 years ago. Why bother sort of thing? So I thought a bit of start, since this is a university lecture, um, why should we remember anything about the past, or what's the use of history? Well, I'll give you two justifications from many. There's a first general justification that every civilized society needs to know about its past in order to understand itself. That's the identity argument. And Sir Michael Howard put it very neatly when he said, all that we believe about the present depends on what we believe about the past. Think about it. There's a specific justification as well, and that is to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. That's the utility argument, if you like. And that was summed up by the American philosopher George Santayana, who said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Well, the 1918 flu is something that I hope we don't have to repeat, um, and I'll say a little bit more later on about the likelihood or not of that. But first of all, just to set the scene and, and pin down the topic, the 1918 Spanish flu was a major world event. In the grand sweep of global human global history, uh, it's a big one. It was the worst pandemic since the Black Death of the 14th century, which killed about a third of Europe's population across 1348 to 52, but in England there is very good evidence to suggest that the death toll might have been as much as a half, 50% of the population. The best estimate for the 1918 flu remains about 50 million deaths. Um, I've seen a, a subsequent estimate uh, by a demographer suggesting 60 million. You may find websites where journalists have suggested up to 100 million, but I'm not, I don't buy that one. I'll stick with conservatively with about 50 million. Uh, the problem is that for a lot of part, many parts of the world, particularly uh, Africa, Central Asia, Southern America, um, there is no documentary evidence surviving. So we just don't know uh, how many people might have died there. But as more evidence is found, the death toll keeps creeping up. I was at a conference in Madrid last November and heard papers there on India, Malawi, Mexico and Suriname, uh, adding thousands more of hitherto uncounted victims. So why should we remember the 1918 flu? Well, the most urgent reason is that the risk of another flu pandemic remains high. Um, we had near misses with the Hong Kong bird flu in 1997 and with the Mexican uh, H1N1 flu of 2009. Um, in 1997, uh, the world was saved from a possible pandemic by the actions of a New Zealander, Robert Webster. You might have heard Kim Hill interviewing him recently on the radio. And Rob was in a position at the World Health uh, Organization to uh, recommend the immediate uh, destruction of all of the live poultry in the Hong Kong markets, because that was where the new virus was coming from that was starting to spread among humans. And by slaughtering all of the chooks, about five million of them, uh, it stopped that infection in its tracks. There are now four dominant strains circulating, and I hope most of you were sensible enough to get your flu vaccinations this winter, uh, covering all four of the, of the current strains. But at least nine new strains of influenza have appeared in humans since 2000. Um, the second bird flu, the AH7N9, and there's the enabler, as Rob Webster calls it, the AH9N2, appeared in China and Taiwan in 2016 and is still circulating there with quite high case fatality rates. Last year's vaccination programs in Australia and the UK uh, were not as successful as usual. Um, and I was at a conference in Melbourne back in February which was debating the reasons for this. Um, we're not still not quite sure, but influenza viruses are extremely clever, tiny little things, but they're always one jump ahead of us. And it seems as though uh, the uh, development that was expected in the virus uh, last year uh, 
the vaccine went that way, the virus went that way, and it, it didn't cover it. Um, but we have uh, the additional problem that one of the dominant strains, the, the old Hong Kong H3N2, is becoming uh, more volatile and egg resistant. And this is a problem because about 85% of our flu vaccines are, are made or manufactured uh, in fertilized eggs. Um, as one of the speakers at that conference put it, this virus has become, quote, exquisitely adapted to humans. <laughs> in other words, it, it understands us better than we understand it. So I would argue in a general way that some of the lessons from 1918 may still be relevant today, um, and I'll explain some of those as we go along. How does flu get spread? Well, here's one of the ways. I'm sure all of you who've travelled overseas uh, engaging in this era of mass jet travel will have seen, uh, seen something like this. Uh, my wife and I remember we were in, in uh, Los Angeles airport last year on our way, on our way to Madrid. Uh, I commented on the fact that it was absolutely jam-packed with hundreds of people. Uh, it would only take one or two with a flu virus to begin to spread it, among others. So that's how flu can get spread today. How did it get spread in 1918? Well, keep that in mind and look at this. That's Timaru, Stafford Street, Timaru, on the 12th of November, 1918. Oh, by the way, the date scratched down there is wrong. That's the correct date over there. Uh, but again, you can see people just came out to celebrate the end of the war, uh, coughing and sneezing at each other and spreading infection. Why is it called Spanish flu? There's a very simple answer there. Uh, Spain was a neutral country in the First World War um, that had no newspaper censorship. So when the Spanish king got the flu, Alfonso XIII, uh, it was headline news around the world. And thereafter, you know, the journalists had a catchy title for any other outbreak of influenza and called it Spanish flu. Um, ironically, the king had the mild first wave of the flu, uh, but it became associated with the severe and very lethal second wave. Um, I draw your attention to the book there by Laura Spinney. That's the best recent survey of the whole thing, the whole global event. And Laura Spinney says that the 1918-19 flu was a protein event. She could also have called it a hydra, a many-headed event, um, because it was so varied, so widespread, so multifaceted, it's very hard to generalize uh, as different places had different responses. And the impact, the, the death, uh, the impact in terms of mortality uh, varied enormously. Even here in New Zealand, uh, you know, one town like Tim Timaru had a very low death rate. Tamuka, just a few miles up the road, had a, almost double the death rate. But speaking as a historian, I would hasten to point out that pandemic influenza is a social phenomenon as much as a medical or biological one. You can't understand them uh, apart from uh, the geographical, historical, and cultural context in which it occurs. Because people's responses were vary, depending upon their local culture, on their religion, uh, their beliefs about medicine, their beliefs about disease, and of course, uh, their literacy levels, whether they're able to understand uh, warnings in advance of the event. So I would argue for the value of micro-history, getting the facts right uh, and getting the context right. In this respect, New Zealand was early in the field. That's the little book I published uh, back in 1988. Uh, it remains the first and so far only country-level study of this pandemic based on individual death records. And nobody else had been boneheaded enough to do the work. Um, and that, that was back in the days before laptops. Um, and uh, it was all done on paper, uh, index cards, handwritten index cards. Um, although I processed all of the stuff through the university's big mainframe computer, it spewed out reams of cross tabs that I didn't have the foggiest idea what they meant. My best technology was a handheld battery operated calculator to do the percentages. <laughs> it's only in the past decade that epidemiologists have begun to tackle individual death records on a big scale. Um, and I mentioned here the numerous articles by Gerardo Chal, um, a very nice, agreeable chap I met at the conference, Cecile Vibo, 
a French woman who leads a team uh, studying precursor outbreaks, Loni Simonson from Copenhagen, and Zvenedek Mameland from Oslo. Uh, these are people, very active researchers on uh, 1918 pandemic uh, at the present time. I was very pleased in 2005 when Canterbury University Press were able to bring out an enlarged and updated second edition of Black November. Um, a slight change in the title, I'd called it an epidemic first. This is the 1918 influenza pandemic in New Zealand. Uh, I was able to include in this edition uh, all of the photographs and cartoons I'd collected, uh, and particularly the uh, extracts from the many letters and interviews I'd conducted with survivors. Um, so throughout that book, in little boxes, you have personal testimonies of what it was like to live through the 1918 flu. And then last year, I brought out um, this condensed and updated version, a slim one aimed actually at high school kids, um, which uh, I left out all the boring statistical analysis, and you've got the narrative of the main centres uh, with uh, new sections on recent research and memorials, some of the memorials I didn't know about back in 2005. Um, I'll get the advertisement over with here. I bought a few spare copies available, author's discount, $20 if you've got spare <laughs> Okay. Well, going back to my original research, it was uh, about 10 years of part-time or spare-time research, uh, quite apart from all the work I did as, as a young lecturer in the university, trying to crank out articles for my PhD thesis. This was a sort of personal obsession, uh, and I really should tell you the story of what got me started on it which is recounted at the start of uh, Black November. Um, I was talking to my father after dinner one night. Uh, I was a young parent at that stage, and I said, well, what do you remember about your childhood, Dad? He was a little boy in Taumanui, middle of the, on the main trunk line. Um, and uh, he said, uh, oh, the black flu, without a doubt. I said, what, what, what flu was that? Um, I mean, I'd done a course in New Zealand history. I'd never come across it and later on discovered that Keith Sinclair's Penguin History has just two lines on it, that's about it. Um, it didn't feature in national histories that had been forgotten about for nearly half a century. And he said, well, you know, people died like flies. It was so prevalent and it hit people in the prime of life. Um, his job was to go with his father to look in on, on the neighbours to see if, they'd, if they were okay. Um, his job was to light the fires in the coal ranges. And he also had to look in the bedrooms to see if anybody had died in the night. Ah, and I thought I had him. I said, oh, they just look as though they were asleep. And I'll never forget the shock of his reply. He said, oh, no, no, and that flu, when they died, the bodies turned black. And that really hit me and got me hooked on this subject. And I'll tell you a little bit later on why the bodies turned black. Well, the fruit of my original research, I found uh, nearly 6,500 Pākehā deaths and 1,679 registered Māori deaths. But I was warned in the, uh, in the Registrar General's office in Lower Hutt that uh, Māori registrations in that early period were very, very patchy, um, often very late, and I found newspaper reports adding up about another 580 Māori deaths. So a grand total of 8,573, including 2,160 Māori. Then in 2012, Jennifer Ann Summers completed a, a splendid PhD thesis on the 1918 flu among the New Zealand military from the University of Otago, and she found another 258 overseas military deaths that I hadn't counted. Um, I hadn't counted them because they didn't mention either influenza or pneumonia, but she regarded any soldier who died of sickness in November, December as probably uh, a victim of the flu, so she added another 258. So in this book, I've stuck my neck out and suggested that there are probably about 200 uncounted Maori deaths, particularly in the Waikato and Northland, which would bring the total up to around about 9,000. The death rates for Pākehā, 6 per thousand, but the Maori death rate, uh, 48.9, or nearly 5%. As I said before, there were huge variations in the death rates. Australia was the lucky country. They slapped on a maritime quarantine in mid-October. Um, they kept ships out in the stream. Um, people developing influenza symptoms were brought into tent camps, ashore were not allowed to mix with the general population. They staved it off. It was a long, drawn-out sort of sputtering epidemic in Australia. Um, 
and they finished up with this low death rate of 2.4 per thousand. But they had, um, uh, a, this was the, the mild, from the mild third wave in 1919. The worst case scenario was in Western Samoa, which was then under New Zealand military administration. Um, the ship, the island trader Taluna, coming from Auckland. I mean, they knew that there had been deaths in Auckland from flu, but the um, commander, Colonel Logan, um, influenza was not a notifiable disease, so he said, oh, no need to hold it up, it's only flu, so they let all the passengers ashore, and within a matter of days, 90% um, of the island population was, was infected, um, 8,500 died, and uh, that was at a rate of 220 per thousand. That's a fifth of the population. John Ryan McLean's recent thesis uh, on influenza in the South, South Pacific has painted an even bleaker picture because the loss of adults and the disruption to agriculture resulted in a famine in 1919. So the population of Western Samoa dropped between 1917 and 1920. It dropped by a third, which is a kind of black death death rate. By contrast, American Samoa, just a few miles across the ocean, imposed a strict quarantine. They had no flu deaths. And when some British medicos did some research on encephalitis lethargica in the 1980s, they found that it was all over Western Samoa. These were people who had survived the influenza, but their immune systems had been damaged by um, the high temperature, and they found not a single case in American Samoa. So very, very different outcomes from nearby places. just want to introduce you to some of my collaborators in the research I've been doing in the last few years, where I've been rubbing shoulders with uh, medical researchers rather than historians. This is Lance Jennings, um, uh, one of New Zealand's foremost influenza uh, virologists. Um, he's currently uh, pres regional president of the International Society for Influenza and Other Respiratory um, Pathogens and chair of the uh, International uh, meeting of respiratory pathogens. It's thanks to Lance that I got invited to the conferences in uh, Singapore and, and Melbourne. In Wellington, uh, Professors Michael Baker and Nick Wilson from the Otago Medical School branch in Wellington, um, public health scientists and epidemiologists. Um, Nick has been using my original data and doing very clever um, epidemiological things with it that I was incapable of doing, and we've published a number of articles together in the New Zealand Medical Journal. And finally, to mention Rob Webster, I recommend this book to you strongly. It's a fascinating detective story, uh, Unlocking the Secrets of a Virus. Um, along with uh, Graham Laver, uh, Rob Webster was uh, a pioneering researcher who established the link between migratory seabirds and humans. Uh, the seabirds have a sort of reservoir of influenza viruses, and it's thought that all new all pandemics among humans are when you get uh, a virus hopping species from the birds into humans, to which we have no, uh, no natural immunity. And I mentioned his amazing work to do with the Hong Kong outbreak in 1997. Now, here are some of the puzzles. Um, where did it come from? How did it spread so fast? What turned a mild flu in early 1918 into the killer flu of late 1918? Why did so many young adults die? Because influenza, seasonal influenza, normally kills only the very young and the very old or those with compromised immune systems. And why did the bodies turn black? And in New Zealand, why did Maori die at nearly eight times the Pākehā death rate? And why did more Pākehā males than females die in those particular age groups? Why did Wellington suffer nearly double the death rate of Christchurch? Well, origins, first of all, the old belief that it came to Europe with Chinese laborers who were being brought um, to, to do the donkey work behind the lines to free up more soldiers to fight in the trenches, uh, this has been debunked. Um, Dennis Shanks and others have examined the evidence for this. There's really no good evidence for influenza in China in the places where these men were recruited in early 1918. But John Barry, the author of a very fine book uh, on the 1918 flu, has pinned it down to Haskell County, Kansas, Midwest America. Uh, early in 1918, a GP, Dr. Loring Minor, who was also a trained scientist, um, noted unusual flu symptoms in young adults, and he lost a number of his patients. Um, and this flu spread rapidly 
to the big military camps in Kansas. America came into the war late, you'll know, in, in 1917, and they were training up thousands, tens of thousands of young men to go and help in Europe. And from these camps, it spread very rapidly to Chicago and New York, uh, the rail junctions, and of course, once it was in the railway and hubs, it filtered out to other parts very quickly. Um, the Americans transported something like a million soldiers across the North Atlantic during 1918, um, and they carried the flu with them. Uh, the 1918 virus, I should have explained, is the same type as swine flu that reappeared in Mexico in 2009, um, a H1N1, uh, and it's surmised or thought that it may have had something to do with the um, existence of big farm, big poultry farms and piggeries in uh, Kansas. Um, but it's a bit of a puzzle. We still don't know, uh, did we catch it from the pigs who caught it from the birds? <laughs> or did we catch it from the birds and then give it to the pigs? Uh, there's a lot of d diverse opinion on that one. But this was a scene in Camp Funston in Kansas in March 1918, when hundreds of young chaps came down with flu um, and the death rate was very low. Uh, most of these chaps recovered, um, but it set, it set the wheels in motion for a major world pandemic. That was right. How did it spread so fast? Well, there were massive troop movements. I jumped ahead there, I'm sorry. Um, about a million American soldiers crossed the Atlantic. Ships and trains uh, spread the virus rapidly to the ports and cities and then there would be slower diffusion to smaller towns and rural areas, what the geographers 40 years ago called central place diffusion theory. So the mild first wave spread right around the world in the middle of 1918. A lot of sickness, a lot of people sick, but low mortality. It was unusual in, in Europe and North America to have a major flu outbreak in the middle of the summer because influenza is normally a winter season thing. And it was unusual because it affected young adults. Japan got it in March from naval vessels visiting San Diego in California. Um, and then after a bit of a lull in August, there were massive simultaneous outbreaks of influenza in Europe, Asia, the US, South America, uh, across September, November. It's very clear from the diffusion maps that the severe second wave started in the zone of conflict, the Western Front in northeastern France. Um, the severe wave got down to South Africa in September, September, October, and got to New Zealand uh, late October, early November. Now, what turned the mild first wave into a killer second wave? Way back in 1948, um, Dr. G.M. Richardson suggested mustard gas. You know, he looked at the, the pattern of things. Never before in world history had a big world war coincided with a big pandemic of influenza, and he thought there must be some connection. Um, he suggested that because both sides uh, were exploding tens of thousands of mustard gas shells during 1918, um, mustard gas is a classic mutagenic. Uh, he was involved in experiments in Edinburgh during the Second World War where they found that if you expose uh, simple organisms, molds, bacteria, to uh, dilute amounts of mustard gas, it doesn't kill them, it speeds up their reproduction rate. And he surmised that perhaps it had done the same to the flu virus. Um, there was a fair bit of debate about that, although at a conference in Cape Town, I once asked Ed Kilburn about this, one of the leading American um, influenza uh, virologists, and he, he put his chin on his hand for a minute and he thought, and he said, it's perfectly plausible. It could, it could have worked. It could have happened. But my own hunch is that it had something to do with the fact that influenza was passing through the immune systems of um, thousands of youngish soldiers uh, on the Western Front. And that to get its way through those, immune, those vigorous young immune systems, they developed a kind of faster breeding f uh, flu so that out the other end, you've got a fast breeding flu that knocked people down very quickly. And that, that tallies with the eyewitness evidence that I encountered. Um, it hit people very suddenly. Um, a chap could go to work in the morning, perfectly fit and healthy, and, and stagger home in the afternoon and go straight to bed. Uh, in some of those cases, uh, there were newspaper reports of people dropping dead in the street. Uh, usually they weren't dead. <laughs> they just fainted or comped out uh, from the sudden on onset of influenza. Um, 
The simultaneous outbreaks in the northern and southern hemispheres, however, suggest that the virus may have mutated all by itself quite suddenly and become much more virulent. There is this really creepy fact that the peak of mortality in Auckland coincided in the same week with the peak of mortality in London, which is, is bizarre, that defies all normal conventions of epidemiology. The H1N1 virus may have been particularly severe. Uh, back in the 90s, Jeffrey Taubenberger and his team uh, reconstructed or um, established the genome of this virus uh, from uh, the tissue of the lung tissue of soldiers who died in 1918. Uh, the samples have been preserved in wax, and they were able to use PCR techniques to reconstruct uh, the, the genome. And since then, under conditions of strict security, uh, scientists have been able to uh, recreate the H1N1 virus. And in 27, Kobasa and his team reported having injected uh, macaque monkeys with this uh, reconstructed 1918 virus, and they noticed that it went straight through the defense mechanisms of the throat and respiratory tract, straight down deep into the lungs, where it caused um, severe double pneumonia and death. So it may have been that the 1918 flu was an unusually penetrative, uh, nasty flu. And yet, on the bright side, not everybody caught it. <laughs> um, we know that about a third of humans have natural immunity to colds and flu um, and can carry the virus and shed it without showing symptoms. So um, that's another creepy thought that people around you may actually be coughing virus out uh, without showing much in the way of symptoms themselves. There's a graph from one of Taubenberger's articles showing in North America uh, the death rates. You can see the, the dotted line, the average from 1911 to 1917, um, which is typical of seasonal influenza, uh, high for infants, high for the elderly. But 1918 is so different as that unusual peak. It's what the uh, uh, virologists call a W-shaped uh, graph. Um, the only other flu pandemic that I was able to find that killed young adults was in Europe in 1782. The latest theory about the young adult deaths, um, this is really interesting stuff, uh, Shanks and Brundage um, working quite independently from Alain Gagnon and his team in Canada, um, working on uh, the newly released data from North American cities uh, from individual death records, they noticed that when you plotted all of the, the ages of the victims, uh, it peaked at the age of 28. Both teams found that, and they counted back and realized that that was a cohort born in 1890, which was in the middle of the previous influenza pandemic, the Russian outbreak of 1789 to 94. And the hypothesis they came up with was that early life exposure to severe influenza did something to those people's immune systems. Uh, dysregulated T cells, uh, when confronted by a different flu virus later in, in adult life, um, their, their immune systems panicked, went into overdrive, um, resulting in a cytokine storm or excessive production of chemokines uh, accompanied by epithelial necrosis, pneumonia, and death. Um, so that's, that's a very neat, plausible explanation. And when we applied it to uh, my data for New Zealand, um, unfortunately, there's a big hole in our New Zealand data because Linda Bryder's thesis on the flu in Auckland, uh, which accounts for about 1,100 victims, um, she had, uh, she's lost the original individual data that she had, so we were unable to reconstruct um, uh, the death pattern in the same detail. But for 79% of the Pākehā victims, we established that this, there was a similar peak uh, at age 28. People with pre-existing respiratory conditions were particularly likely to die in 1918. Um, Andrew Neumer and Garin, publishing in 20, 2002, noted a sharp drop in TB death rates in the US in the 1920s. And they drew the conclusion from this that the 1918 flu had, quote, culled a whole cohort of susceptibles. And soldiers with lungs damaged by mustard gas would also be highly vulnerable. Um, I find it, it, it's, it's such a sad, tragic thing for Kiwi soldiers to have survived four years away at the war to come home 
and then die of the flu. <laughs> it seems somehow a sort of ignoble death. And I think that's the reason why we have no big monuments to the influenza pandemic. We've got hundreds of war memorials, because that was a glorious death. But uh, to die of disease seems somehow sort of shameful. Um, other researchers have suggested that the uh, pandemic may have had earlier origins. Uh, Warraby and his team have suggested that as the, uh, the Russian pandemic, the AH3N8, uh, waned, there may have been precursor parts of the H1N1 virus coming into circulation. And Don Olson's work in New York found a similar pattern of, of young adult flu mortality uh, in 1917, suggesting that it may have been a similar sort of virus to the 1918 one. And he also noted elder sparing, that old people didn't get it so badly in the severe autumn wave. Cecile Vibo is leading uh, research into precursor waves, um, and her report at the Madrid conference last year have found a, a range of age peaks between 26 and 32. And if we add in the Auckland deaths to the New Zealand data, uh, that matches up. This is the graph from Black November um, showing uh, males in the top graph, females in the bottom, and you can see that the male deaths are almost double the height of the female in those, that age range, sort of 25 to 45. And these were victims born before the Russian flu reached New Zealand. Interesting stuff. So that drove me back to look at newspaper evidence, thanks to Hooray for Papers Past. Um, and I found 43 separate reports of uh, flu uh, in 1887. It was a severe outbreak throughout New Zealand, and yet very few deaths. And I wonder whether that was a precursor wave. This is the graph on the, on the left there. It's too small for you to read, um, but you'll see down the right-hand side, severe, 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 um, pointing out uh, these recurrent outbreaks. Um, my article about this evidence has been uh, accepted and published by the American Journal of Epidemiology. I think I'm probably the first New Zealand historian to have an, <laughs> an article in that journal. There were recurrent flu outbreaks, 1847, 1860, 66, 1871 to 3, 1876, 85, and 87. And after I'd sent that article off, <laughs> Someone drew my attention to the latest issue of the Turnbull Library Record. Simon Chappell has an article, Death and Disease at the Dawn of New Zealand's History, where he gathers pretty convincing evidence for a massive outbreak of influenza in the Maori population, which killed tens of thousands, he thinks. They called it Rifa Rifa. How did it get to New Zealand? Well, there was the old myth that it came on the ship, the Niagara, the passenger ship coming from Vancouver. Massey and Ward were returning from a war conference in London. Um, the watersiders accused them of pulling strings to avoid quarantine. Um, it got to Auckland on the 12th of October. There had been an outbreak of flu among the stewards. Uh, there had been one death before it arrived. Um, the captain, rather panicky, uh, um, wireless to shore that he had Spanish influenza on board. In fact, he probably the ship had caught the tail end of the mild first wave in Vancouver because the severe second wave didn't reach Vancouver for another month after the Niagara had departed. Uh, as the official uh, health department report by Dr McGill concluded, there is more reason to suggest that Auckland gave the severe flu to the Niagara than that the Niagara brought the flu to Auckland. So how did it get here? Well, the Niagara cases were isolated at Auckland Hospital. There's no way they could have infected the whole city. A far likelier source was the arrival of three big troop ships in Auckland in early October, with hundreds of soldiers, many of them sick and wounded, returning from camps in southern England, where the severe second wave had been at its height. Now, most of these chaps who'd had flu had probably got over it by now, but they were still carriers of the virus. One ship reported 70 serious influenza cases aboard. But they didn't quarantine these ones. The troops were so, the soldiers just wanted to get home. And so they were allowed ashore and they traveled by rail mostly uh, and simply went home. And they scattered up and down the length and breadth of the country. And in early November, you had an almost simultaneous outbreak of severe influenza in the main centers and larger towns. So <clears throat> sadly, I would blame it on the returning troops. The health department's two main responses in 1918 were, first of all, a 2% zinc sulfate inhalation. Now, this is a kind of crude disinfectant. <laughs> um, 
Remember, they knew nothing about viruses in 1918. Back then, people thought entirely in terms of bacteria or germs. Germs was the favourite um, for causing a, a, a disease. Uh, this was really just a, a kind of disinfectant. Um, and it probably did more harm than good by irritating the membranes of the, of the bronchial tract uh, and may have exposed people to um, the possibility of pneumonia. The other treatment was a strong expectorant cough mixture which contained alcohol. <laughs> so you can imagine how popular that was while the pubs were shut. Um, this is the Dunedin example of the inhalation apparatus, which if you want to see it in the flesh, is on display in the Canterbury Museum at the moment, at the end of the World War I exhibition. It was found under an old house uh, in Dunedin by a property developer called Glenn Stapley, um, who had no idea what it was until he happened by chance to see the cover of my book in the public library. And he said, ah, that's what it is. And he sold it to Te Papa for an undisclosed sum. <laughs> Yeah. Um, images from the uh, flu in Christchurch, uh, the sidecar there, people distributing uh, medicines and uh, food, the three Boy Scouts there. Uh, I must tell you the wee story about the Boy Scouts. Um, when I was writing this book, I was living in Rickerton, uh, in Euston Street, and there was an elderly chap who lived near, near Rickerton Road, um, and I used to say good day to him as I went past. And he asked me, he said, what are you working on at the moment? And I said, oh, I'm writing a book about the 1918 flu. And he said, oh, my brother was in the scouts. He had something to do with that. I said, that's funny. I've got a photograph of three scouts. I'll bring it down to you. So I brought it down. He looked at it and he said, that's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Westgarth was his name. Uh, talk about a small town. This is uh, from Havelock um, uh, in Marlborough, a temporary flu hospital. Many places set up these temporary wards because the, re the main hospitals were overwhelmed very suddenly with a big influx of flu cases. Um, so they set up these temporary halls in halls, uh, school halls or church halls. Um, and at first I thought, I tended to assume that these were, you know, havens of peace where lives were saved. But I've come to the conclusion they were probably death traps because so many of them were being run by volunteers, not by qualified nurses or doctors, but by volunteers who did not know how to nurse pneumonia cases. And I think many of the victims of the flu died from sheer neglect. Uh, if they didn't understand about sponging to keep the temperature down or replacement of fluids, um, these people might well have, have died from neglect. And putting them all together, you had the risk of cross-infection of different types of pneumonia. Why did the bodies turn black? I'm sorry, I've been keeping you waiting all this time. Very simple explanation. It's a medical condition known as cyanosis. When the lungs are badly inflamed and the alveoli burst, um, the lungs fill with blood and fluid, and that reduces the oxygen exchanged into the bloodstream, and that causes the skin, it loses its healthy pink look and turns a kind of dusky purple or heliotrope color. And in 1918, the victims, as my father testified, uh, turned black very suddenly. They also started to decompose and go smelly very quickly, and so they had to be buried within 24 hours. Another myth about the 1918 flu was worth debunking. Uh, Karen Starko, an American academic, proposed back in 2009 that aspirin poisoning accounted for the high death toll. Um, the US Surgeon General had recommended high doses of up to 30 grams a day just before the peak of mortality in most American cities. But uh, Neumer, Carrion and Johnson comprehensive refute, comprehensively refuted this idea in uh, 2010. They pointed out that there, were, there was very little aspirin in India, but millions upon millions died. About 12 million people died in British India. The dosages recommended by the Bayer Company were very low, only 10 grams a day. But in fact, aspirin was the only drug that really worked in 1918 because it had the, the ability to lower the body's temperature to normal and to relieve pain at the same time. So in many New Zealand hospitals, uh, the doctors who were trying all sorts of things, things like quinine, um, they realised that aspirin was the only thing that really controlled the pneumonia. Why did Māori die at nearly eight times the Pākehā death rate? Well, you'll have to wait. There's an article being considered by the New Zealand Journal of History in which I try to answer that. But it was a very vulnerable population. 
From that photograph, which is undated and we don't know the location, judging by the most vulnerable age groups, probably the only two survivors from that group would have been the two boys because the young adults were in exactly the really high um, risk age and the elderly chap in traditional costume there would, one, would have been one of the elderly Maori who died. So just a guess, but that would be my reading of that, of that visual evidence. The Maori population, having lost so much of their land in the 19th century, in many places had been reduced to poverty. They had poor housing. Uh, many were still living in traditional Raupo sleeping huts, um, where they packed together at night to keep warm, and the exchange of droplet infection was enhanced. Poor sanitation. Most Maori settlements were notorious for typhoid, which was why Pākehā avoided them, they wouldn't go near them. And they had high levels of typhoid, tuberculosis, and tobacco smoking. Um, those old uh, paintings by Goldie and Lindau of Maori um, kuia puffing on pipes are probably very typical of their day because uh, it's, we've been, it's been discovered that Maori women took up tobacco with as much as enthusiasm as the men. Not just smoking, but also chewing tobacco. And the Maori population was mostly rural in 1918, so they may have missed out on that mild first wave which conferred some degree of immunity on those who had it. Interestingly, there's a contrast between the Maori and Pākehā death rates. Maori male and female deaths were almost exactly the same. The graphs are in sync. So why did Pākehā males aged 20 to 40 die at double the death rate of females in those age groups? Well, there are no definitive answers here, but I've got a hunch that it was probably because the men as breadwinners treated the flu as if it were just a cold. Um, there was no unemployment benefit in 1918, so even though they were feeling dreadfully ill, they knew they had to get to work in order to feed their families, and they would then suffer relapse and pneumonia. The best advice for flu, then as now, is when you start to feel crook, go to bed and stay there until you're better. Uh, try to make sure somebody nurses you properly along the way. Why did Wellington suffer nearly double the death rate of Christchurch? Well, that needed another lecture, which I gave on the 22nd of July for the Canterbury History Foundation. And if you're interested, the text is still available from the History Foundation uh, at that ad address. Now, I want to say a little bit uh, in the next few minutes about memorials. Um, New Zealand lost about 18,000 soldiers killed across four years of the First World War. And nearly every town has a war memorial. But about 9,000 civilians, doctors, nurses, volunteers, and some soldiers died from the flu in just two months at the end of 1918. And yet there are no official memorials to the flu, no public reminders of what happened. Canterbury has two statues of doctors who died, very rare. Um, Dr. Little at Waikari. Uh, in fact, there's another monument to him at Culverdon and most famously Dr. Margaret Cruikshank at Waimati. She was the first uh, woman, a female gra medical graduate, to enter general practice in New Zealand. She took over Dr. Barclay's practice when he went off to the war, and she worked herself to exhaustion looking after the whole town during the 1918 flu. Um, Dr. Little's statue is well deserved, a very a much loved uh, country GP, but neither monument to him mentions the fact that his wife, who rejoiced in the wonderful Old Testament name of Hefzeba. Um, she was a nurse from Christchurch Hospital who also caught the flu and died in November 1918. So he gets the statue, she doesn't even get a mention <laughs> other times. Um, just to lighten the, the atmosphere a little bit, I've got a story to tell you about Dr. Crookshank. She was doing her rounds in her Wilson gig. Um, went in to see an old gentleman and discovered that she'd left her stethoscope in, in the buggy. Instead of going back out, she was so tired, she thought, oh, look, I'll do it the old-fashioned way. I'll just put my ear to your chest and listen to your lungs. You start counting, and I'll tell you when to stop. So she put her weary head on his chest and fell sound asleep. <laughs> she woke up to hear him intoning, 985, 985. <laughs> um, but she is a, a much-loved uh, figure there, and they're having a commemorative, uh, a day of commemorative events uh, for her later on in, uh, in November. 
Now, Maori memorials. I knew nothing about these when I published the second edition of Black November in 2005. On the left at Motukaraka on the Hokianga Harbour, um, you have the names of eight uh, members of uh, two leading Maori families of the district. And when I checked them against my uh, death records, uh, only half of them had been registered. The one in the middle from Tairina, which is inland Hawke's Bay, um, where uh, Maori uh, provided the uh, labour for shearing gangs, um, that memorial has about 50 names on it, and only about a third of them were actually registered. Um, the monument on the right uh, in the King Country at Tekura uh, doesn't have any names and is not accessible to the public anyway. So those two memorials tended to confirm my hunch that a lot of Maori deaths had escaped record, they hadn't been recorded. This is the corner of Featherston Cemetery where most of the 77 soldiers who died there are buried and the obelisk in the background has their names around the base. On the right you see the big open area at Waikamiti Cemetery in uh, Auckland, West Auckland. Um, I was there, this monument was unveiled in 1988 um, just after my book was published and they had consulted me about the numbers uh, for the inscription. Um, many people in Auckland think that this is a mass grave, you know, a big open pit. Um, but no, this area, they're, they're all individual burials, but they're mostly paupers' graves. Um, young chaps who were in Auckland looking for work, who caught the flu and died, and people didn't know how to contact their families, and other poor people who just couldn't afford to put up a headstone. So they're individual burials in coffins, but um, they didn't, don't have headstones. Could we cope with a new flu pandemic to wind up to get to the conclusion? The short answer, I think, is yes, we probably would cope pretty well. I mean, we coped reasonably well in 1918, but I think we could cope better uh, now. Uh, the worldwide influenza surveillance system should give us good advance warning of a new pandemic. The system's worked pretty well since 1997. And the pandemic plan that we see there on the left, this is the, the new edition last year, um, is a whole of government response. So every government department has an obligation or duty to respond and contribute its resources. And the Ministry of Health holds regular uh, workshops uh, on flu vaccination and exercises to, to make sure people know what to do. Um, one of the lessons that I suggested to them from 1918, Welling one of the reasons for Wellington's high death toll is that Wellington was leaderless for more than a week because the district health officer, Dr. Watt, came down with the flu, the port health officer, Dr. Pollen, got the flu and died from it, the superintendent of the hospital got the flu and was out of commission, and a couple of other key people as well, and the mayor didn't have the authority to get relief work started. So I said, you know, don't have single individuals in key decision-making positions, have teams of people so that if half of them go down with the flu, the other half will know what to do and carry on. Um, the ministry has stockpiles of uh, the famous plug drugs, uh, like Tamiflu, uh, to halt the spread of inf if, if an infection gets into the country. My own personal hunch is that there's no point in closing the borders because it'll be here before we know about it with uh, people tra coming back from overseas. Um, these plug drugs are very clever. Um, invented, so it is said, by some Australians in their lunch break. <laughs> um, but they'd observed that on the surface of the uh, virus, um, the, the, the rods which carry the um, uh, neuraminidase and the hemagglutinin, um, there's, a, there's a kind of notch which enables the uh, virus to latch onto a cell to break in and replicate. And if you can fill that, that gap, um, that notch, it, it can't break in. Um, that's in very simple layman's terms how Tamiflu works. The problem is you need to take it within 48 hours of infection. Uh, and most blokes don't admit to having the flu <laughs> for at least a couple of days, so it may not work. Um, the Ministry has stockpiles of antibiotics to deal with pneumonic infections. Um, on the darker side, they also have 22,000 body bags in storage somewhere in Lower Hutt. Uh, they have stocks of face masks. And the recommendation is, you know, social distancing to reduce the spread of infection. And we have social media, you know, Twitter and Facebook and, and email and so forth, to give expert advice on nursing uh, flu cases at home. And there will be all sorts of bits of advice, like wash your hands, because you can pick up the virus from cold surfaces. Um, if someone has sneezed on it, 
you can pick up the virus for uh, quite a few days afterwards. And the Maori population is now fully integrated into the health system, although their health statistics are still not as good as they should be. So we're well prepared, but as a historian, I would have to say all sorts of things could go wrong. Would we have enough antibiotics to deal with the pneumonia? Would we have, how would you administer them? Um, how would you allow for people who have allergies to set penicillin, for example? You have to allow for all sorts of things. In 1918, a lot of people fell ill at the same time. So you can expect hospitals to be swapped and primary health care to be reduced. Uh, Pegasus Health here in Christchurch have worked out a very good scheme uh, whereby medical centres will carry on as normal for ordinary sick people, but set up influenza centres and other premises so that you keep a separation between the flu cases and ordinary sick people. Um, Another thing that could go wrong with Facebook and Twitter, um, what President Trump calls fake news, might well cause fear and panic and isolation. And um, the big question to me is, as a historian, New Zealand society has changed enormously since 1918. Would people once again risk their own lives to help their neighbours? And we have a conundrum here, because on the one hand, the ministry says, you know, go and help your neighbours, but on the other hand, keep your social distance. Well, one way around that that I'd suggest are face masks. There's been a lot of debate in the literature about the efficacy of face masks. Um, they have to be very good indeed to keep viruses out. Uh, N95 is the best one for that. But even a really thick gauze mask will, will go some way to keeping out uh, bacteria. So if you're nursing someone with pneumonia after influenza, wearing a good thick face mask is pretty vital. But the thing is, you have to change them every few hours because they get wet as you breathe through them. So you have to have a pile of them on hand. The lessons from 1918, I think, are still relevant for the response today. I've just already mentioned that. Uh, don't rely on key individuals. Train up teams. Prompt response is crucial. Uh, looking back at the pattern of response in New Zealand towns and cities, the ones that responded promptly and got themselves organised, like Christchurch, were much better off than the ones that delayed and didn't get organised, like Wellington. We should all be prepared and self-reliant. Here in Christchurch, we're ready for earthquakes, but I'd suggest that you add face masks and paracetamol and things to your, to your kit. And in terms of communication, um, it's very important that officialdom, the health department, don't um, hide the truth, because otherwise people will believe rumours. Can I just give an example for that? The Minister of Health in 1918, George Warren Russell, better known in those days as Rickety Russell because he was the MP for Rickerton, um, he, using wartime censorship, he ordered newspaper editors not to publish any statistics about deaths because he thought that people would panic. But it had exactly the opposite effect. Because there were no official figures, rumours spread, and I interviewed an old chap in Auckland who insisted that there were tens of thousands of flu deaths. I said, well, where are they buried? He said, oh, well, they probably dumped them at sea. <laughs> so people will believe anything when they're under stress in a time of, of, um, where people are dying. I think once shown what to do, people will respond and do their best. Christchurch, we saw a remarkable community response from the earthquakes. Neighbours helping neighbours, the student army. Um, this suggests that New Zealand still has pretty ample social capital. But you have to remember a pandemic is a very different sort of disaster from a fire or an earthquake. Flu often comes in waves. In 1918 it was the second wave that was much worse than the first. And in some countries there were third and fourth waves going through 1919 and 1920. Final advice, get to know your neighbours and be nice to them. <laughs> you may not like them much, but be nice to them. They might save your life. We should also look out for people living alone and for minorities and recent migrants, perhaps people who uh, don't speak our language very well or have different culture, different um, religion. Um, they could be overlooked or even worse, scapegoated. Be prepared and expect the unexpected. And finally, for those who collect acronyms, there we are. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Any questions?
I noticed that Burwood Hospital, the new part, has an extremely large foyer that seems like wasted space. I wondered if it was actually planning to be an auxiliary flu um, hospital area if necessary. Do you know anything about that? That's quite possible, but uh, I don't know for sure. Alistair, do you know anything about the planning of Burwood Hospital? I don't think so. It was probably the architect enjoying the space. <laughs> Where did they decide to put the, um, the not hospitals, what are they called? Sorry? Could you repeat the question? Uh, where did they put the flu centres here? Where or when? Uh, where do they put the flu centres? Who decides it? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, for Pegasus Health, I think uh, they already have identified premises where they could set up separate flu centres oh. in, in the event of a pandemic outbreak. Uh, I know that they have earmarked particular hotels near the airport where if a, an incoming plane has a lot of flu cases on board, they can actually quarantine all of the passengers uh, until their temperatures go down or symptoms disappear. So what happened to the flu? Is uh, like the plane died out and it's vanished? Well, what happens to the flu? Why did it die out? Uh, well, the flu, uh, the thing is, as more and more people get infected, they acquire their own immunity to it. And the important thing to remember is that although between a third and a half of the world population caught the flu in 1918, the vast majority got over it, recovered. Um, it was the unlucky, world, in world terms, 2 to 3 percent who died. Um, but the ones who survive have immunity to that particular strain of the virus. Um, and that's why uh, it settles down to a sort of seasonal flu and changes, it's called antigenic drift, from year to year. Um, uh, I could have explained in more detail the technicalities of it, but a pandemic is called by antigenic shift, which is a bit like changing from one primary colour to another one. But drift is like changes shades of the same colour, but just changing shades. You mentioned in passing that not all death certificates showed flu as the cause of death. And um, thinking back to a, a young ancestor of mine who died in 1918, and when we ordered the death certificate, we were half expecting to see Spanish flu, but there was, it was a totally different, it was heart just given as the cause of death. How do you compile accurate statistics <laughs> in that situation? How do you compile accurate statistics? That's a jolly good question. Yeah, um, I, was, I was very cautious as a young researcher I erred on the side of caution, and I only counted the ones that had either flu and or pneumonia, or something related to it. But there were cases I could see where the death certificates in those days gave the duration of last illness. And that was very useful, because quite often they would say, um, influenza seven days, cause of death, heart failure. So I would count that as somebody who had been weakened by the flu, but suffered heart failure. Um, what was very irritating to me was that doctors were often very reluctant to identify influenza because they regarded it as a harmless sort of infection. Um, and so they would put um, malignant bronchitis or, or some other form of words. But I could usually sort of read between the lines and guess that that was related to the flu. Um, other causes of death, um, uh, <coughs> women dying, pregnant women dying, and women dying in childbirth after a week of flu. Uh, I counted them, and the suicides, of course, because there were quite a number of suicides. Um, uh, the Wellington ones stick in my mind. Um, one poor chap shot himself because he felt he couldn't provide for his family. Um, by shooting himself, he certainly would not provide for his family anymore. Um, and there was also a sad death in, in Wellington, which I did count. I thought about it for a long time. But he was a man who was crossing the road. He got knocked over by a speeding ambulance. <laughs> His death would not have happened if it hadn't been. So I was taking a slightly broader social definition, but I was careful to count just those identifiable with influenza. But um, Jennifer and Summers took a much broader sort of sickness definition. Um, if your father developed an immunity to that particular flu virus, could he have passed that on to you, that same immunity? Is that possible? I don't, I don't think so. No, the flu doesn't, doesn't pass down the genes, I'm afraid. No. 
the Tower of Louis, uh, there were probably only about, um, he thought, uh, probably about 90% of the adults went down with the flu. Um, so there was only a handful of families able to look after them this time. You've just explained about the drift that triggers another pandemic. When you look back over no, history... It's, it's, it's the shift which the shift. creates pandemic. Drift uh, occurs season to season, year by year. Thank you. Um, when you look back over history, is there any kind of cyclical nature? Does this uh, happen every, every so many years? It used to be thought that influenza came back about every 20, 25 years, but actually the, the, there's no consistency in the duration between big pandemic outbreaks. Um, the historical record going back, um, we can identify from the symptoms is probably about as far back as the 16th century, and the gaps are, are all over the place. And there's nothing, nothing regular about it. And why should there be? Because each new pandemic is caused by a different avian virus sneaking into the human population. And at that time, we'll be random. Yeah. Did uh, flu have an influence on the length of the war in the Western Front? Yes, it did. Um, I could have said a lot more about this. Laura Spinney is very good on this in her book. Um, uh, America came into the war late, 1917. And the Germans knew that there would be a gap while they were training them, getting them ready and equipped, before they could bring massive numbers over to France. And so Ludendorff, General Ludendorff, planned a spring offensive. As soon as the winter had eased, um, they would use the divisions that had been freed up from the Russian front, front because Russia dropped out of the war after the revolution. And they, they <clears throat> by rail, they brought thousands of men across to the Western Front to knock out the British and the French before the Americans could arrive. And they failed. And it's mainly because influenza, the mild influenza, was right through the German army. And regiments just were not capable of offensive operations because there were so many sick people there. And this was the mild way. And Ludendorff blamed the flu. But you'll hunt high and low. The military historians, bless them, <laughs> don't think of disease. They, they will just think of military things, and most of them don't even mention the 1980. Um, when you were looking up these, certif these certificates, the death certificates, did you have to buy them all, or did the government give you access to them? <laughs> I was very lucky. Um, nowadays, yes, you would have to pay for each individual one. When I got interested in, well, I, I thought of working on Town Manui after talking to my father, then I thought, well, oh, it's a little remote country town. I'll do Christchurch. I just wandered into the registrar's office down in Manchester Street. He's a lovely chap, Mr. Aiken, he had a club foot on him. And I said, um, could I have a look at the death registers for 1918? And his face lit up and he said, I've been wondering when somebody come look at this stuff. He said, there's page after page and they're all dying of influenza and pneumonia. So I sat down and I was just absorbed. Especially when I discovered that from where I lived in Walpole Street in Waltham, somebody had died in the house just around the corner. And I thought, that, that really got me hooked on local history. And so he let me just have free access. So I did my article on Christchurch, which was in the New Zealand Medical uh, Journal of History in 1979. And then Linda Bryder in Auckland and Martin Cuff in Dunedin copied my methodology and did their pieces on Auckland and Wellington. Then, then I realized, gee, that's broken somewhat. But anyway, um, we could do a book. And Linda Bryder was going to help me with that book, but she got her scholarship and went off to Oxford and left me <laughs> to do the rest. Um, and it took, took several years of uh, just holiday work uh, to get through the rest of the, um, the death registers. So I had page after page after page of this stuff. Um, you'll be pleased to know that um, my dear wife helped me to uh, make a spreadsheet last year of the registered Maori deaths, um, and we have sent that back to the Registrar General, and it is being made available to all Runanga throughout the country. Just today we had a very nice stack email about that, um, and Ancestry.com have photocopied all of my other um, pages of notes from the death records. Uh, they're trying to compile a complete New Zealand database, but they have this awful problem of the, the lack of the Auckland individual data, uh, the names as it were, that's what they're after. Um, and as you would observe, Linda Bryder did her uh, statistical analysis in age groups, not by individuals. Uh, good evening. What a remarkable um, uh, presentation. 
I have, a, I have one question. Is, um, uh, I heard that um, history helps us to understand where we came from and also um, helps us to see where we could go into the future. Um, with all your years of experience and all this research that you um, that you that you compiled and, and the time and effort that, that you put into it, I'm I'm interested in um, uh, whether or not you identify <coughs> you have identified um, that the the strains or different strains can come to a point in our future or even today that we wouldn't be able to combat it with um, uh, uh, um, a, a, an antidote or something like that? Good question. Um, it's impossible to predict influenza outbreaks. They happen quite at random and unexpectedly. Um, all we can do is to be as prepared as we can be um, and hope for the best, I think. Um, as a historian, uh, it's fascinating studying the past because you realise that people in the past did not know what was going to happen the next day or the next year. You have to get yourself back into their shoes to realise that they could not see through the curtain into the future. Uh, they only knew about what had already happened. Um, and historians uh, get through that curtain with what's called the gift of hindsight. We can look back and see how the pattern develops. But at any point in history, life is full of choices and variables. And things could go this way, or they could go that way, depending on what people decide to do. Um, that, for me, that's the absolute fascination of studying history. Um, and I think if people today realized that they have, in a way, their own future in their hands, that by making the right decisions, you can avoid bad outcomes. That, that's essentially the message I was trying to do tonight. Now you talk about how uh, large amounts of poultry were culled to prevent viruses from spreading in Hong Kong. Um, do you see a future in which there is the opportunity to prevent a virus from spreading, but people are pr protect their industries um, and actually allow, say, livestock or poultry, which is infected, to spread? just for the continuation of business as usual, instead of um, actually, actually uh, stopping a virus in its tracks. That's a very good comment. Um, uh, in China, they have been, or for a long time, they've been um, giving antibiotics to their poultry to keep them healthy. Uh, and this is, a, for many uh, people, this is a problem if we're you know, getting um, unwanted chemicals in our food. But, um, they have also been inoculable vaccine, vaccinating poultry against known current strains. This is one of the reasons why the H9N2 hasn't spread very much, because it, it's been limited within the poultry population. But what I should, I don't want to get your hopes up, but the other possible um, development in the next 10 years or so would be a universal influenza vaccine for humans. Um, uh, at the moment, vaccines work on the, the head of the spikes, the um, uh, neuraminidase and glutenin. Um, but there's work being done on attacking the shaft, you know, the stalk on which they sit. And if we could disable them, then you can knock out the virus as a whole. Um, Rob uh, Webster's book uh, is very hopeful about this. He thinks it's very tricky, very difficult research. Um, and getting something that actually works will take a lot of time. And of course, it has to be tested in the human population first. But it's possible, it won't happen in my lifetime, I don't think, but perhaps in another 10 years we might have a universal human vaccine, which will just help the human population expanding exponentially until there are far too many humans. <laughs> Sorry. Did the 1918 flu affect people of bigger build than Yes. And why? Yes, it did. Um, uh, I'm interviewing people here in Christchurch. Many commented that it wasn't, it wasn't your, your thin, weedy, chesty types, the way I was as a youngster. Um, it was your big, strong, outdoor, robust men who went down. And the suggestion is that their immune systems overreacted and operated very strenuously to deal with the virus, and, and they drowned in their own fluids, overproduction of chemicals. Um, 
Do you think that um, these kind of flus and viruses will actually help the world by decreasing the population? <laughs> what a dreadfully deterministic... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I doubt it, but um, it's possible that something else might... Uh, Mother Nature might produce some, something else out of the hat that we're not expecting. I mean, people were very worried about the outbreak of SARS because there seemed to be no way of treating it and it had a very high case fatality rate, and Ebola is another one. Um, something else may pop out of the woodwork that we don't know about, um, but I don't think any of us would wish. I mean, Black Death, look around the room. What if, you know, every third person across the road suddenly disappeared? It's a very grim prospect. And yet Europe survived and went on to have the Italian Renaissance, you know, in the following century question about, so in your research for the 1918 flu, did you do any research on what happened in Europe in the 1660s with the outbreak of plague then? Um, because I was watching some, done a bit of research myself on um, the, the, the two major outbreaks of plagues in Europe in the uh, 1300s and then in the 1600s as well, and how they were different types of influenza, but different, one was bacterial, one was viral, and how they were a bit different. Um, I think it's just a theory at the moment, but did you do any research on those to prepare you for, this, for the 1918 one? Not directly in relation to the 1918 flu, but because I taught a survey course in European medieval history, I was very interested in the Black Death. And so my wife will testify the fact we have boxes of books in the garage still about the Black Death, um, which I don't want to get rid of just yet. Um, the Black Death was undoubtedly bubonic plague in origin. But um, there's a lot of dispute in the literature um, about whether or not the bubonic plague, which after all is communicated by rat fleas leaving dead rats to bite humans, whether that could have caused such massive mortality. I doubt that. What really killed people in, in the 14th century, right through to the, to the 17th century, was probably when people had the, had the, the bacteria and it got into their lungs, they would develop pneumonia, and then that could be spread by droplet infection as easily as influenza. And that, of course, goes like wildfire, and you have a sort of 90% case fatality rate. And that would explain um, the patchiness of the Black Death, where some, where some areas like Flanders, I mean, very urbanised area, the weaving towns of Flanders, had very low mortality. And I think it's because the, 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 the Black Death sort of burned itself out after Paris, and they were in a, a kind of rain shadow, uh, in effect. Uh, but in Britain, in England, uh, the lines of transmission have been very well reconstructed. There's an awful lot of good evidence for England, uh, not so much for the continent, because um, France, Germany, the Low Countries have suffered so much warfare in succeeding. A lot of their early records have gone and disappeared, but a lot of records have survived in England. Um, so I would put my money on pneumonic plague as the real killer because bubonic plague is actually very slow moving. And the last great outbreak in Bombay in 1911, I think it was, only killed about 3% of the population. Whereas the outbreak of pneumonic plague in Manchuria in the 1920s killed tens of thousands. So, you know, it's another fascinating topic. Do you want another lecture? Do you want to hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Not too much, too.